I'd like to discuss this very interesting case of a posterior polar cataract, the first that I've ever encountered with a pre-existing opening in the posterior capsule. So now knowing that there is already an opening in the posterior capsule, how would our approach to this patient be different? We need to carefully counsel the patient to make him understand that we are going to have challenges that we face during the surgery, which may affect the outcome, as well as the possibility of a second surgery should we need to do so. And at our end, we need to be prepared without any doubt to be able to perform an automated anterior vitrectomy, be prepared for a vitro-retinal intervention should that be required in case of a nucleus drop, and have at hand ready calculated for the correct power different options of IOL such as a three-piece IOL which may need to be placed in the sulcus or an iris claw lens should you use that as an option of your choice. And the last point that I'd like to discuss before moving to the surgery is the kind of anesthesia that one would choose for a case like this. Knowing that you have an opening in the posterior capsule, the unpredictability of how long the surgery is going to take and what you might face intraoperatively, I would choose to give a peribulba or a subtenin block to give me more control and that's what we did. Let's now move to watching the surgery. And this is the case. You can see there's a very early nucleus sclerosis. There's a classic posterior polar cataract. And along with it, you can see the classic elliptical opening of the polar cataract. And as you can see, the opening in the posterior capsule is not complete. That is, it's not from one equator to the other. It falls short of it on either side. Let's now move to seeing how we managed this case. Meticulous care is taken while creating the 2.8 mm tunnel as well as both the paracentesis incisions. This is followed by the staining of the anterior capsule with blue dye with a view of enhancing visibility whilst performing the rexes. Following the staining of the anterior capsule, viscoelastic is introduced into the anterior chamber to deepen it and flatten the anterior capsule prior to performing the capsular rexes. Being a case as challenging as this, we want a limited room for error, if not any. And therefore, I think it's important that we need to ensure that the cystome is perfectly made. This is because we do know that a faulty tip of a cystome is known to create an erratic rexes. Let's now watch the capsular rexes. Knowing that there's a good possibility of needing to place a three-piece IOL in the sulcus, we aim for a rexus that's about 5 to 5.5 millimeters to provide adequate anterior capsular support should it be required. And as you can see, this is what we've achieved. A small 5.5 millimeters centered rexus. The next step is the hydrodelineation. We need to be extremely careful that we don't accidentally inject the fluid in the subcapsular plane. As you can see, the needle is introduced well within the nucleus and a jet of fluid is injected, thereby resulting in creating an endonucleus. We then introduce some viscoelastic into the anterior chamber prior to the phacoemulsification. Let's start with the phacoemulsification. We work with very low flow settings. I have a power of 15 to 20% because this is such a soft cataract a vacuum of about 250 millimeters of mercury and a flow rate as low as 22 to 24 cc per minute. Because don't forget, this is an even more compromised case of a bolo cataract with a pre-existing rent in the posterior capsule. Watch how the phaco probe now holds on to the nucleus and only in the aspiration mode, elevates it out of the capsular bag and aspirates it in the bubulary plane. With extreme care and caution, I now try to separate the epinucleus from the equatorial plane in the epinucleus mode of phacoemulsification and attempt to aspirate it. Let's see how we manage the rest of the case. With care and caution, I try and remove the epinucleus from all sides first prior to engaging the central part of the epinucleus. Failing to disengage the epinucleus any further, I remove my second instrument and perform a viscofluid exchange prior to removing the phaco probe out of the eye. I now mechanically try and disengage the subincisional epinucleus. This is what you will see in this part of the surgery. 
Having successfully disengaged the upper nucleus and bringing out into the center, I now introduce the phaco probe and with extreme care and caution, aspirate it. Watch closely as the last bit of the upper nucleus starts to get aspirated. You will be able to see the classic polar opening in the posterior capsule. A viscal fluid exchange is performed once more following the completion of the epineucleus removal. So thus far, we have been successful in removing the endonucleus as well as the epineucleus without any disturbance in the vitreous or any dropping any part of the nucleus or the epineucleus into the posterior segment. Some more viscoelastic is now introduced into the anterior chamber in an attempt to prevent any vitreous herniation during the removal of the cortex with irrigation aspiration. Let's now wash the cortex wash. With care and caution, maintaining the irrigation facing the angle at all times to prevent any vitreous hydration and herniation, with care and caution, the cortex is aspirated. Once the right half of the cortex has been removed, the aspiration is removed from the eye, a viscofluid exchange performed, the irrigation is then removed from the eye, the hand swapped over, and then the rest of the cortex is aspirated. This is what you'll see in this part of the video. Let's watch the last part of the cortex removal. Note how with care and caution, the cortex is drawn out into the center and quickly aspirated. This now completes the cortical wash. And having done so, we once more perform a viscofluid exchange prior to bringing the irrigation out of the eye. Viscofluid exchange maintains the anterior chamber depth and prevents vitreous herniation. And following the completion of the nucleus, epineucleus and the cortical wash, let's see what we have here. You can now see that the tear in the posterior capsule is extended from equator to equator, most likely as a result of the intraocular manipulations. And also note that we have an anterior chamber free of vitreous. We now proceed to the introduction of a 3-piece IOL in the sulcus. In order to enable the ease of entry of a 3-piece IOL, the 2.8mm incision is now enlarged to a 3.4mm incision. We now proceed to the loading and the insertion of the three-piece IOL. Following the introduction of viscoelastic within the nozzle of the cartridge and over the IOL, it is snapped shut and the plunger then pushes the IOL so as to bring it anteriorly up to the tip of the nozzle. Having done so, the orientation of the leading haptic is carefully observed. Let's now watch the insertion of the IOL in the ciliary sulcus. The nozzle of the cartridge is introduced well within the anterior chamber to enable the leading haptic to go most comfortably into the ciliary sulcus. Having achieved this, the optic is then injected into the anterior chamber and the nozzle withdrawn from the eye, almost always leaving the trailing haptic out of the eye. It is stabilized with the second instrument. Viscoelastic is then further introduced into the anterior chamber once more to deepen it. And then with the help of a Kuglin hook, watch how the trailing haptic is now dialed into the ciliary sulcus. We now perform a posterior optic capture wherein the optic is pushed behind the rex's edge on either side. You can clearly see the ovalization of the rexes from the successful posterior optic capture. With extreme care and caution, the excess viscoelastic is gently removed from the anterior chamber. One should be extremely cautious while performing this step because One should be extremely cautious while performing the step because the irrigation flow can actually cause the deepening of the anterior chamber and it's quite possible to lose the posterior optic capture. Following the completion of the visco wash, all the wounds are hydrated.
And this is the end result that we achieved. A stable 3 piece IOL in the ciliary sulcus with a posterior optic capture. We managed to perform the case without any vitreous disturbance and without losing any of the nucleus, epinucleus or the cortex into the vitreous. I do hope you found this case interesting. It's the first that I've ever performed with a pre-existing opening in the posterior capsule. Thank you.